The Lawman Lynch Show on BFS TV New York. We are entertaining. We are educational. We are engaging. Every Thursday at 9.30 a.m. and a repeat at 5.30 p.m. Welcome to another edition of The Lawman Lynch Show. It is a privilege for me to be here sitting with none other than the one and only Congresswoman Yvette Clark. How are you? I'm doing well, Lawman. Thank you so much for having me on your program. Thank you very much for, for agreeing to of be course. on the program. I really appreciate that. I want to talk to you, Congresswoman, about your journey in politics. But before we get to that, you were born in Brooklyn. Absolutely. You are Brooklyn born. What Brooklyn was it like born. growing up in Brooklyn? Wow. So I came of age uh, during the 1970s, 80s. I was born in 1964. Wow. And I've lived in Brooklyn all of my life. Uh, during that time, it was uh, in the wake of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what I learned as a child was very focused on community, on identity, and knowing that uh, the sky's the limit right. in terms of what I could accomplish. Right. Uh, my home and family, uh, my parents are from Jamaica, West Indies, right. and so uh, I had a blended environment in right. which to grow up. One that was part back home, Jamaica, Jamaica right. and part Brooklyn and all that Brooklyn had to offer. Awesome. It was uh, a time where uh, you knew who your neighbors were mm -hmm. and they helped to raise you. Right. And they raised expectations for what you could accomplish. Right. Uh, a really great time to be a kid in Brooklyn because, uh, you know, everyone was looking out for everyone, everyone raised each other's children. And so uh, there was a lot of awareness right. uh, growing up of just about everything that took place. Took place, right. Did you ever visit Jamaica oh, growing are you, up? All the time. time. I was that American kid they would ship down <laughs> every summer. Everyone in Jamaica knows at least one right. that was either from England or from the U.S. Right, right. And I was that kid. So my parents had me traveling to Jamaica as, as an infant. Right. And... Every year, whether it was Christmas holiday, uh, summertime, anytime there was a break in school. You're off to Jamaica. I wouldn't even come back <laughs> home. They would have shipped the barrel about like two weeks prior. Right. And when I got there, all everything I wanted, everything I needed was right. in the barrel. Right. What was it like in Jamaica when you visited? So that's a very interesting question because uh, my mother is from country. She's from uh, the parish of St. Elizabeth. Right. And my father's from the city. He's from Kingston. I'm a Kingstonian. <laughs> oh, okay. So I would start my time in the country. Mm -hmm. And when I first started traveling, uh, my earliest recollections was of being on a sugarcane farm because my okay. grandfather was a sugarcane farmer. Farmer, okay. And uh, they didn't have electricity at the time. Wow. So I went down during a time where roads weren't paved yet mm -hmm. in that particular part of the parish. Right. And so I just had a great time with my cousins and family and neighbors and adjusting to being in a rural environment. Right. I, I was born and raised in, in Brooklyn, in Brooklyn right. right? But my grandparents were so outstanding. My cousins, I would cry at night, I, won't, I, I will admit, right. as a child, because it would get so dark and the stars would be so bright mm -hmm. and there was kerosene oil. And then, you know, I had these cousins that like to tell duppy stories. Yeah, duppy stories. For those of you who don't know, that ghosts, all right? Yeah. <laughs> and um, so it would scare me. Right. But, and, and you know, everything that comes in, when you have a kerosene lamp lighting the way, if anything gets around that lamp, it casts a big shadow. Right. So it used to scare me. But, um, I mean, I, I think what I learned there were um, really traditional Jamaican values and, and, and morals. Um, and what it was like for my mom right. to grow up and, and why she was driven to do the things that she did. You're cultured, and I think yes. that, is, that is very important. And even as I walk into your office, you know, so distinguished and, and, and all, and 
to for you to share that story yes. it really and, and and my viewers will definitely know that it really gives us a different insight as to who you really are because you you lived the story I you do, can I really have. speak to you know that experience absolutely um, i'm really a jamaican jamaican yes. <laughs> and brooklyn if there was supposed to be another caribbean you know destination it has to be brooklyn absolutely brooklyn is a place. absolutely um, what at what age do you think you really got the knack for politics or just representing the people? Hmm. I would say that those are, are two different things. Uh, one, uh, I've always had a passion for people right. um, and service to mm -hmm. others. Right. Um, and so my household, again, I have to go back to my mm -hmm. home and family, was very engaged with families in the community, right. whether it's the uh, Parent Teachers Association in my early elementary years mm -hmm. in school, or it's the Block Association right. that was organized to make sure there were activities for the young people, people. in the community. Those civic activities mm -hmm. were something that my parents exposed me to. Right. And, you know, it, no daycare in those days, so whatever meetings were taking place, I would be at the meetings mm -hmm. with my parents and listening to how adults were addressing the issues of the day and organizing themselves right. to make sure that they could provide the best opportunities, opportunities right. for young people as they could. Uh, fast forward, because my mother was so engaged, she took leadership in a whole lot right. of different areas, and we became acquainted with the political uh, people of the day. Right. My, my political um, consciousness right. was being cultivated at the same time that the community activism was taking place. Right. And so I saw it as uh, part and parcel right. of what can happen when people uh, utilize their leadership right. to help others. I, each time I visit your mom, she, you know, I'll, I'll go to her office or whenever we're in any social space and she's like, son, you know, she reminds me of my grandma. <laughs> and I'll, I'll go to her office and she'll just put me in a corner. You stay right there until I'm ready. And she'll move around the office like grandma cooking. And then she'll come and she'll sit and she'll say, okay, so what no? <laughs> what no, mm -hmm. lawman? Um, that is the Dr. Clark, you know, that I know. Yes. And... Uh, on a personal level, but she has blazed a trail. Absolutely. You know, um, not only for women, but for Caribbean leadership in the diaspora. Absolutely. What, what, how do you feel as an offspring, like a daughter to a living legend? Like You know, it's so interesting. Uh, you know, of course, there's an immense sense of pride. Right. You know, because I grew up with my mom. Right. She continues to be an integral part of my life. And so I saw her developing her leadership skills. skills right. I saw, I witnessed her uh, passion and drive mm -hmm. uh, for people, and it inspired me. Right. You know, to have a living legend, as you've put it, yeah, in the household is, is um, you know, something that, uh, at, you know, certain stages of life you take for granted mm -hmm. just because you're raised that way, but as you reflect on it now, you can say, wow, this woman. I know where she came, came from. Came from, right. And I know what she's been able to achieve. Achieve, right. And I know what she's made it possible for my brother and I to achieve through all that she sacrificed, all that she did, all that she did to help others. I tell people this all the time. Mm -hmm. The other side of Una Clark that a lot of people don't, don't know. know is the fun-loving... She is. Dancer. Dancing... <laughs> doesn't miss an opportunity to tell you how much she loves you right. person. And, and I tell people, as much as my mother has adopted so many other young people, yes, she has. people throughout her life, my brother and I never felt deprived of her love. Right. So when someone has that magnitude of ability to touch the lives of so many people, yet not miss a beat with her own family, that's a very special yeah, person. Yeah, she is, she that's is. That's a gift. Uh, that God gave our family, our community, and so she's, you know, treasured. She's yeah, she a treasure. is. She's a, she's, a, she's a national treasure. Absolutely. She is. We're speaking with none other than Congresswoman Yvette Clark. We'll be right back. The Lawman Lynch Show on BFS TV New York. 
Welcome back to our show. I have the privilege of speaking with Congresswoman Yvette Clark. Uh, you serve one of the most dynamic and diverse districts in New York. Um, do you mind telling us? About Certainly, your, your the ninth congressional district mm -hmm. is an extremely diverse constituency. Um, it starts at the Barclays Center, which is Atlantic Avenue, Avenue. Mm -hmm. and goes straight down the middle of Brooklyn. So it goes out to Sheepshead Bay. Okay. I describe it as going from Atlantic Avenue to the Atlantic Ocean. Hmm. Right? Interesting. And yeah. it picks up a number of communities as it goes south. But it starts uh, in the west in Park Slope okay. and goes east to Brownsville. And okay. then moving north-south, it's uh, Prospect Heights, Crown Heights, uh, Windsor Terrace, uh, Flatbush, East Flatbush, Bush, okay. um, Prospect Lefferts Gardens. Then we can go into Midwood, Madison, Marine Park. Garrison That's Beach. a large district. Well, it's it's a lot of neighborhoods, a right. lot of communities, but it's one of the most compact districts mm -hmm. in the United States, States of America. Yeah. And very diverse. Extremely diverse. What are some of the challenges uh, your constituents um, you know, face based from where you sit? What are some so of the in things? all of this district, mm -hmm. there are varying challenges. I think overarching for many in the community is the cost of housing. Right. That is a huge challenge with all that is taking place in development. Uh, the, the, what I would call sort of a traditional uh, uh, community. Right. Been living in this part of New York City for generations now. Have never seen their rents escalate mm -hmm. to the extent that they are right now. Right. I mean, and, and with the new developments coming in, right. they're even starting at, at cost prohibitive rates wow. for a lot of people who are working class, who are immigrant, who have come to this community um, and who have lived here for some time, mm -hmm. uh, never thought they'd witness that level of cost of living right. in terms of housing. On top of that, we're dealing with issues with regards to immigration. Mm -hmm. Because this district is a immigrant portal, if right, you will. It is. A lot of families come and, and start here um, in this district, raising their families, educating their families, being entrepreneurial, uh, look, uh, looking for opportunities, right. maybe working in the city, living here in Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. um, they are under siege right now, quite frankly, right. from um, the administration in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C., because many uh, came as children or young people and were given a provisional status as deferred action for childhood arrivals. Right. Others uh, have uh, come under temporary protected status. Status, right. Both programs have been under assault by the administration. Mm -hmm. And then the fact that the immigration system has been broken for some time. Mm -hmm. People are waiting for visas. People are waiting to adjust their status. And the wait is forever. Right. I right. was at an event um, some time ago. Mm -hmm. And a former prime minister of Jamaica was the guest speaker at this Caribbean event. And mm -hmm. he spoke about immigration being an issue. And in his presentation, he was like, you guys need to reach out to Yvette Clark. She's doing so much you know, for, for the community. What are you doing in Washington as it relates to DACA and immigration on behalf of the, of the people? So it's very rare in Washington that you have an advocate in the form of an Yvette Clark. Right. For the most part in the United States, people uh, have seen the face of uh, the Hispanic. Right as uh, the person in need of immigration reform. Mm -hmm. They're not used to seeing the African descendant. Right. And so I use my voice on a regular, a regular basis to make sure that I widen the aperture so that people recognize that th this lack of a 21st century immigration system has far reaching impact for Correct. so many different people. Correct. And that uh, we're all asking that uh, we be given uh, the type of human dignity 
Correct. acknowledgement of our human dignity and that we do right by people. Right. That's what this nation is a nation uh, that was created by right. immigrants for right. immigrants. Right. And, and so I'm constantly out there uh, using my voice. I'm at the table for negotiations, particularly when it comes to something like diversity visas, Correct. which uh, our communities are most impacted if they were to eliminate that program. I'm the voice for temporary protected status <clears throat> because of the large Haitian population within my constituency. Mm -hmm. And that goes right to the heart of so many uh, Haitians who are in blended families. Right. Within our, our immigrant community, our families tend to be blended. Someone is here on temporary protected status. Another person may be a DACA recipient. Someone else hmm. may have a green card. Right. And then we all have that uncle that came and never left, has no True. document whatsoever. <laughs> True. Right? So, and then you have the citizen within that same Mixed. household. Right. It's blended. And so any person under any one of those, um, those designations, mm -hmm. if were they to be removed, would be a hardship. Right. Would, 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 would create would. a dynamic that separates families. Um, and, and, and we can't abide with that. Right. So one of the things that I've done is I've introduced a bill called the Aspire Act. The Aspire Act. Yes. Okay. And what the Aspire Act does is it provides a pathway for those who are under temporary protected status to maintain that status as they seek to adjust their status for permanent for permanent, residency. Okay, perfect, perfect. Mm -hmm. sounds for like, permanent sounds residency. Good. So those are some of the challenges. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. I am familiar with Flatbush, um, so I know of the Flatbush Kitten market. market. Yes. That's, that's a major, you know, development underway. What are some of the accomplishments of, of, of your tenure? Well, I with? would say that the biggest accomplishment has to be the Affordable Care Act. Care Act, right. It has to be because it was a major undertaking and it has provided for millions of people, mm -hmm. many of whom live right in this district, right. to finally access the health care that they need. Part of the challenges for our community is our life expectancy. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, all this uh, coming to the United States uh, to start a life and then to have illness hmm. take that away from us, our ability to work, to raise our families. People sort of uh, take their health for granted. And what the Affordable Care Act does is it makes sure that from our littlest ones to, to our, our seniors, seniors right. they're able to access health care to have the quality of life that everyone in this nation should have. Certainly we know our wealthier brethren and sisters, mm -hmm. you know, they have top-notch yeah. state-of-the-art yeah. health care. Mm -hmm. Our humanity deserves nothing less. And so that, I would say, is my number, number one, one number one accomplishment. It, it's been challenging in Washington mm -hmm. uh, since the Republicans took over in the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. That backlash from electing President Obama has really been an obstacle to progress right. for our communities. Right. So, you know, we continue to fight for a fair opportunity justice, equality, and equity right. within our society. Because my focus, quite frankly, is on entrepreneurship. Okay. It's on entrepreneurship nice. and creating opportunities for business. Right, because that thrive. stimulates the economy. You Not know? only that, and it provides employment for our people, for people. who are underemployed, unemployed, uh, discriminated on in the workplace. Right. That unable to access uh, housing. Right. Yes. Right. You're, you're so it, without the economic means and without creating uh, opportunities, um, our communities languish. And, you, and I learned that from my grandfather, from grand, okay. who was a sugar, sugar cane, cane farmer. farmer. As, you, as you mentioned your grand farmer again, mm -hmm. you, you, you just mentioned President Obama. Yes. And I've, I've said this to you before, but I want to capture it again. Yes. I sat in my living room when you descended Air Force One, <laughs> when, you know, Barack Obama visited Jamaica. How did that make you feel? You know, from a young girl visiting Jamaica, going to rural Jamaica, having no electricity, <laughs> you know, um, 
afraid of dopey stories, <laughs> you know, and, and being so cultured and being able to visit Jamaica many years later on Air Force One, the most popular aircraft in the world. How did that make you feel? Wow, I can only tell you that uh, it was a real source of pride for me. It was um, one of those moments where you sort of take it in mm -hmm. um, at, at, on so many different levels. Because um, as we landed in Kingston, Jamaica, I could think about the fact that I have two grandparents who are buried there, wow. right? And that I have cousins and an uncle who live in Kingston and in the nearby right. area. And uh, I don't know that as a meeting me as a child, they could have ever imagined yeah, that one day I would come with the very first African-American president. president of the United States. Um, and so that was an overwhelming feeling, knowing that, um, you know, for my grandparents um, and having having had the ability to know my grandparents, mm -hmm. to, they were a part of my life for a very long right. time because we have longevity in our family, right. um, that I would come back one day, it, it, it was overwhelming. Uh, the other side to it was I was representing the United States, States of, America of America and a constituency that was not just a, a Jamaican constituency, but there is a huge Caribbean constituency. Right. And I represent the dreams and aspirations of all of those immigrants who came here and who are raising their families here, who have children born in the U.S. Mm, right. and hyphenated by whether it's Trinidad, Barbados, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, mm -hmm. Grenada. You can go down the list, right? right? That they could see in me uh, that person they elected to advocate for right, them, right. to advocate for the region. Because the reason I went to Jamaica with the president was uh, he was en route to the summit of the Americas. Americas. And we had a number of issues before the Congress that we needed to discuss. And I was the most prominent Jamaican-American Jamaican, right. in the Congress at the time. Congratulations. Thank you Congratulations. so much. Thank you. We're speaking with Congresswoman Yvette Clark. We'll be right back. The Lawman Lynch Show on BFS TV New York. We're back speaking with Congresswoman Yvette Clark. A spirited conversation. I'm learning so much from you, Congresswoman. Thanks for, for agreeing to be on the Absolutely. program again. Um, this is a question that I like to ask individuals. You know, what, what, where do they see themselves in five years or ten years? I won't pose that question to you, but what I would want to know is, like, what is your vision for your district? So, you know, I, again, I, I have to go back to the fact that I was raised in such a very wholesome environment here right. in Brooklyn, where socioeconomic um, boundaries did not stop people from interacting and setting the bar, bar for bar. Uh, accomplishment. Uh, race was not a barrier. Gender was not a barrier. And there was a real uh, effort to create that village that raised the child. child. Mm -hmm. And I lament the fact that we don't see those types of sentiments shared as much mm -hmm. now in the 21st century. And so my vision for this district is to create opportunities for that to occur okay. in the 21st century. Great, to great. look at how I can impact particularly young folks in giving them um, the tools they need and the access to those tools right. to be able to pursue their dreams. Their dreams right. um, I think that America is all about the American dream because it's an experiment. Mm -hmm. You know, we, 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 we create right. this democracy. Right. And I want to see young people of color um, be able to take their rightful place among their peers right. in uh, receiving justice so that they're not discriminated against because of the uh, color of their skin, skin. Mm -hmm. uh, their, uh, their gender, uh, their sexual preference, right. that this is a society right. where they can use their talents to the fullest and reach their potential right. and continue to build strong communities. Right. You, you raised a number of, po of points just now. And for me, 
um, disloyalty and inequity, inequity and all those things annoys me. What annoys Yvette Clark? It, uh, ignorance. Ignorance. You know, quite frankly, you know, it doesn't take much to learn, to read, to have access to information. And what I would say is willful ignorance. Right. Because we're seeing some behavior from adults today that, um, you know, it, it, it should not be. Right. In this day and age, right, um, it, it it holds back society when uh, you know, for instance, you hear the NFL say that uh, that peaceful protest is uh, something that uh, they frown upon, and they're going to find anyone who speaks out mm -hmm. about the fact that young black males are treated differently by law enforcement in in some in in in, in certain circumstances Senses, right. and that uh, I don't want to generalize but we you know the police brutality mm -hmm. that young people young men and women, women right. are experiencing should not even be a part of uh, whatever they bring to the table it is what they bring to right, the table right. and that should and they have a right to express their views You're correct. in this country. Who or what inspires you? Oh man, my constituents inspire me. Mm -hmm. I tell people all the time, I'm around a lot of folks and I can't say that my constituents don't inspire me or my mom or my dad doesn't don't inspire mm -hmm. me, but it's everyday people that I find inspiration right. in. Young children who are speaking to me and telling me about what how they see their lives going, that, that motivates me to go back to Washington, right. D.C. and do everything I can to create, op create opportunities for them to have those visions come forth. When I came in today, um, one of your interns mm -hmm. um, said that she was starstruck. You know? <laughs> and um, you, you inspire so many young people, you know, middle aged, you know, seniors and, and all that. Like you cross boundaries. I tell I, people you, I, I'm the bridge. You, you're the bridge. You really cross boundaries. I'm the bridge. So normally I say, you know, motivate my, my young people, motivate my, but in general, just motivate my viewers, you know? Well, let me say one thing. Mm -hmm. I want your view, viewers to know that uh, we have the talent, skill, the expertise to, to build communities. Um, we have the power to shape our own destiny. destiny. I believe that when we recognize how powerful our vote is and unleash it in the elections, every single one of them, we are moving now right. to consolidate power in a way in which we are taken seriously. Right, right. But when we waver, when we are distracted, when people can suppress that power, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we're giving our power over, over. to those right. who are not trying to work in our best interest, right. who correct. are not trying to collaborate, who are not trying to coalesce, but have their own agenda, and we're not on that agenda. Right, right. Well, or we are. We are, but in, but in a very exactly, negative way. Exactly. Congresswoman, I want to thank you. It's my I pleasure. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you for having me. Thank Bobby. you very much. Um, I want to encourage you, encourage you to continue doing the work that you're doing. A lot of individuals are benefiting from your advocacy. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for watching this, another ed edition of The Lawman Lynn Show. But remember, in everything you do, be the best you. The Lawman Lynch Show on BFS TV New York. We are entertaining. We are educational. We are engaging. Every Thursday at 9.30 a.m. and a repeat at 5.30 p.m.